ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth, yet it is one of the least explored areas on the planet. Why? Most of the vast, watery world is cold, dark, and under high pressure, which makes it difficult to study. Since the beginning of ocean exploration, scientists have used and created technologies, like scuba, to better understand deep ocean life. These days, scientists are still scuba diving, but have new tools like underwater vehicles and submersibles to help them explore ocean depths. Today, we'll learn more about the way scientists are exploring the ocean and discovering new life when we meet with Smithsonian ichthyologist, Carol Baldwin. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Maggie Benson, host of Live from Curious, Smithsonian Science How. We have a great show for you today, but before we dive in, I wanna ask you a question. You can respond using the poll that appears to the right of your video screen. Do you think there are new species of fishes still to be discovered on coral reefs? Of course, no way, or maybe you're not sure. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right. Our results are still coming in, so let's go to our live guest. Today we have with us Dr. Carol Baldwin, a systematic ichthyologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Thanks for joining us, Carol. Thanks for having me. Systematic ichthyologist, that is a mouthful. What is that? That sounds kind of icky, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's actually a fascinating field of study. Uh, ichthyology is the study of fishes, and systematics is the study of the diversity of life and how it's uh, related. Uh, so I study the diversity of fishes, and I'm especially interested in coral reef fishes. Wonderful. So given that you study the diversity of fishes, you'll like our poll answers. 100% of our viewers think that there are new species to be discovered on coral reefs. Yay. What do you think about that? <laughs> the, viewers are, the viewers are right. Um, despite the fact that ichthyologists uh, have been studying the diversity of fishes on coral reefs for about 200 years, wow. um, there are still a lot of new species to be discovered. And this is particularly true of deeper reef areas that haven't been well explored. Why haven't they been explored that? Well, well, we typically study coral reefs using scuba gear, uh, but standard scuba gear only allows us to go down to 120, 150 feet or so. And these deep reefs uh, can occur much deeper, down to 1,000 feet or more. Um, there are deep diving submersibles that will take scientists really deep in the ocean, uh, even all the way to 36,000 feet. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's as deep <laughs> as you can go. Um, but history shows that if science, uh, scientists have access to these deep diving subs, uh, they don't typically typically stop at 300 feet or 800 feet or so. Um, so there's this zone in the ocean between about 200 and 1,000 feet that uh, science has largely missed. And it might be home to a lot of diversity that we still don't know about. Is there a specific habitat that you're looking at in that range of 300 to 800,000 feet? Yes, um, specifically uh, what are known as deep reefs. And deep reefs are just natural extensions of shallow water coral reefs. Um, and as I mentioned, they may go down to 1,000 uh, feet or more. Um, these aren't you know, long barrier reefs like you might find in shallow water. Um, they're usually patches of reef, but just like the reefs in shallow water, um, the deep reefs are home to sponges, corals, fishes, lobsters, crabs, uh, you name it. So the same players in, in shallow and deep, um, but the species are typically different. So you mentioned that scuba diving only gets you so far. How are you actually studying these deep reefs? Well, at one site in the Southern Caribbean, I have access to a mini submarine that's called a submersible. Um, this is the Curasub submersible, and it's capable of going to 1,000 feet. And in fact, it's restricted to 1,000 feet, so that's a good thing. It forces us to stay in this zone um, that we've uh, missed in the past. But this uh, is a fabulous uh, vehicle. It has a, a big window in the front, so I can look directly out onto the deep reefs. That's very cool. And it's docked in Curacao. Is this it right here? Yeah, that's it. And it's housed in a garage. And when it's time to dive, they uh, wheel it out and lift it with a crane. And you can see there that they just swing it over um, and then lower it into the water into a boat slip that's uh, designed especially for it. It looks like a big toy. <laughs> <laughs> it does. A big bathtub toy, right. Um, and the hatch uh, door, you can see people getting in there. You go in through the top. And that orange hose that they're putting in there, that's air conditioning. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, which is a good thing because it gets kind of warm uh, in the sub when you're sitting at the surface. You cool down some as you go, um, but they try to keep us cool at the surface. And then the, when the hatch door is closed, the sub starts uh, motoring out and uh, it'll blow off some air to try to uh, sink the sub a bit so we can uh, descend and head down to the deep reefs. So what's it like inside the sub? Um, the sub holds five people, uh, four passengers and a pilot. So two people lie on their stomachs in the front of the sub and they look out of that big window. And then the pilot sits on a bench between their legs. And then there's a bench behind the pilot where two people can sit and there's a porthole on either side that they can look out of. Very cool. So you study fishes. What are you looking? What kind of fishes are you looking for in these deep reefs? Well, I'm really just trying to document what species do live there. Um, and some of the things I'm finding are species that we already know exist, um, but maybe we don't know very well. Um, but more importantly, um, I'm finding a lot of new species, and that are, those are species that science didn't know existed. How do you know it's a new species? Can you tell how it looks? Well, sometimes we can go by how it looks, and particularly color patterns uh, often allow us to recognize a, a new species. Um, if you look on the screen now, uh, we thought there was one species of banded basslet on the deep reefs off of Curacao. Um, but the pictures uh, there, uh, you can clearly see that there are two species. Uh, the one on the top has orange on the fins, and the one on the bottom has yellow, and the pattern of the black markings um, is different in the two. So which one of those was the new species? <laughs> um, well, we think the one on the top is the new species, and that's because the original description of the banded basslet included an illustration um, that looked a lot more like the, uh, the one on the bottom. Um, but it's an interesting find, because although both of those species are living on the deep reefs off of Curacao, they're not living at the same depths. So the one on the top uh, lives between about 200 and 400 feet, and the one on the bottom between about 400 and 600 feet. So it's not just a matter of shallow reef diversity versus deep reef diversity. This deep reef is actually breaking up into depth zones, uh, each of which has its own inhabitants. Wow, that's so interesting. So we already have a student question. Are you ready okay, to take sure. it? This is a really great one coming from Ben. And Ben wants to know, when do you use the two plural firms of fish? Fish versus fishes. Oh, Ben, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, if you're talking about uh, more than one species, uh, you refer to them as fishes. If you're talking about a single species, you use fish. So if you have an aquarium that has all of one species, that's an aquarium of fish. But if you have a bunch of different species, in that aquarium, uh, then it's an aquarium of fishes. <laughs> and even your English teachers probably don't know that, so you can teach them something new today. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So you talked about how you can tell the difference between those two species um, that we just saw, those banded basslets, by the color patterns. Are there any other tools that you bring to the table when color pattern doesn't help you tell? Sure. Um, sometimes we use DNA. And uh, one time, DNA allowed me to identify seven new species of a little blenny fish uh, from the genus uh, Starxia. They're very but, pretty. Uh, they are, yeah. The uh, particular DNA tool that we're using is called DNA barcoding. Um, and this involves taking a, a small piece of muscle from the fish and then producing a short DNA sequence that's called the DNA barcode. Every species has a unique DNA barcode. Um, so it's sort of like going into your grocery store. Uh, every product has a barcode. And when you get to the checkout counter and scan that barcode, information about what the species, I'm sorry, <laughs> what the product is and uh, how much it costs uh, come up. But for me, the, uh, the fish DNA barcodes can help me figure out what species I have um, or how many I have. That's very cool. So you are able to identify these seven with seven very unique barcodes of their own. Absolutely. Each one has a unique barcode. Very cool. So I see these fish here that you're studying, and I know that you're being able to actually research them in a sub. How do you get the fish if you're inside of a sub? Oh, that's a good question, because I can tell you often you want to just reach your hands out and pick up things, but it's a little more challenging collecting with the sub. Uh, the, Cur uh, the Cur sub is equipped with um, a lot of tools that we can use to collect organisms for things like sea stars or sea urchins or sponges that don't move or move very slowly. Um, we can just scoop them up with a basket in the front. Um, for collecting fishes, we take advantage of the sub's two hydraulic robotic arms. Um, one of them has a, uh, a green hose that, that can eject 
inject a substance called a fish anesthetic, and that makes the fish sleepy. And when they start to nod off, then we can bring the other robotic arm in that has a blue suction hose and pick them up. And then they go into that hose and around and into a collecting canister um, at the bottom. So when we come up uh, in the sub and come back to the surface, we can take that canister uh, the, of things we've collected as well as, as things that are in that front basket and take everything to the lab. And then what happens in the lab? Well, we try to identify everything as best we can. Uh, we measure specimens, we label them, we take a tissue sample for DNA analysis, and very importantly, we take a, a color photograph so we can document the living color pattern. So how do you decide when you're in the sub which fish to collect? Well, um, we try to be very conscientious about only taking what we need. Uh, we're trying to get at least one specimen of every species that lives on these deep reefs. Um, but ideally, we'd like to have more than one, at least a few. And that's so that we can uh, get a handle on variation within a species. Um, organisms that live in the ocean are just like humans. If you look around you, the people around you probably don't look exactly like you. So the same is true of fishes and other organisms. So if we get a few specimens, that uh, helps us look at the variation within a species. So once you collect them and you process them in the lab, is that it or do they go somewhere else from there? Well, after we're done with them in the lab, then we uh, carefully pack them up and we ship them FedEx back <laughs> here to the Smithsonian. <laughs> and actually, that's the same way that the nation's T-Rex came here last week. Wow. Yeah. Good so delivery system. <laughs> it is. And uh, when they get back here, then I unpack them and put the specimens in jars of alcohol and take them, the fish specimens, to my lab to study them in more detail. Um, and then after that, they become permanent parts of our bio biological collections here. Why would we want to keep them permanently, though? Well, uh, the, Smithsonian, the Smithsonian's biological collections are literally libraries of life. So if you go into a library and you take a book off a shelf, you can look at that book and see who wrote it, when they wrote it, how many pages it is, what its, a, what its catalog number is, what it's about. And the same way, I can go into our fish collection, uh, take a jar of fish, and look at the label and see what its catalog number is, what it is, um, who collected it, when they collected it, how they collected it, a uh, lot of information. Uh, we have about 4 million preserved fish specimens in our uh, Smithsonian wow. fish collection Wow, that's here. a lot. It is. In fact, that's about the same number of people that live in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> so that's a lot of preserved fish specimens. But these collections are priceless. I mean, they give us an incredible record of uh, what uh, lives where, and we can use that to detect changes in populations in the future. So I see some of these specimens that you brought here, part of our collection, are from Curacao. Can you tell us about Curacao and the work you do there? Sure. So Curacao is a Dutch island in the Caribbean, in the very southern part of the Caribbean. In fact, if you stand on the south coast of Curacao on a clear day, you can see Venezuela. So uh, it's way down there. Wow. <laughs> and that's where the, um, the Curacao submersible is based that, that I've been talking about. Um, the, the sub is based at a, a complex called the Curacao Sea Aquarium, um, which is on the screen now. In fact, if you look at that picture, you see the buildings with the orange roofs. That's a hotel, and just right above them, uh, near where that red arrow is pointing are some buildings with white roofs, and that's the uh, substation Curacao, where the Curacao submersible is based. So that a uh, red arrow shows where the sub comes out of the boat basin, um, and that dark water that you saw right in front of the aquarium is deep. Those are the deep reefs. So um, you can see how close it is. So within minutes of climbing in the sub, uh, we can be at those deep reef depths. So who, who are the we? Who are you doing this with? Are you working alone or with others? Um, no, we have quite a big group of people. Uh, in, in 2011, um, I established a new Smithsonian research initiative called DROP, Deep Reef Observation Project project. And we have about 20 Smithsonian marine staff who are part of DROP. So we're not just studying fish life. Uh, we have scientists who are studying sea, ur sea urchins, sea stars, mollusks, hermit crabs, algae, you name it. Um, pretty much everything that lives down there. Have you found anything? What kind of discoveries have you made? Yeah. Um, so far, we have about 30 new species of fishes and invertebrates. Wow. And that's uh, what makes that uh, remarkable is that the study area, this area where where we're subdiving um, right in front of the Curacao Sea Aquarium is small. It's only about uh, one tenth of a, a square mile. Um, but remember that you know we're focusing on this zone that science has largely missed in the past. So it's not too surprising that we're finding uh, some new life.
So um, we want to learn about some of these fish spe specimens that you've brought here. Can you tell us about this one in particular? Sure. It's very um, cool. This is actually uh, something called a sea toad. Um, it is a very colorful fish in life. It's uh, yellow and pink, and um, but it's related to, uh, actually you can see the colors on the screen now. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, it is a beautiful fish. Unfortunately, when we put things in ethanol and alcohol, they lose all those colors. So that's another reason why we take those color photographs before we preserve the specimens. Um, but this uh, fish is actually related to a fish that I bet the students are familiar with, and that is the anglerfish, the deep sea anglerfish, the one that has the lure coming off of its head with the luminescent oh, tip. Oh, yeah. And if you look very closely at this, you can see the, the, the lure on this one here. It's very short in this, and it's not bioluminescent, but it does have its own little lure. So this is a relative of the anglerfishes. And that just black area actually stays um, preserved in that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we we uh, we lose uh, all the yellows and oranges and you know reds and blues in the fishes, but the black, which is melanin, um, is retained in preservative. So I see that you have another fish right here that looks really interesting and it has a cool color pattern. Can you tell yeah. us about it? I'm going to pull this one out actually so you can get a better look at it. So this is uh, a relative of a flounder. It's a type of flatfish. And uh, we don't know yet whether this is a new species or not. It looks very similar to a flatfish that is uh, found on shallow reefs, um, but that one is restricted to about 70 or 80 feet. We found this one at 500 feet. Wow. So that's a big difference in the depth range. Um, we're going to get the DNA, DNA data back for this uh, specimen next week. So, so next week you'll know if this is a new species or not. We should not. know because we have a DNA barcode from the shallow species and so we can compare it to the one we get from this and we should know whether or not they're the same or we have something new here. That's really exciting. Can we stay in touch with you and let our viewers know if this is actually a new species or not? <laughs> that would be fun, sure. Wonderful. Um, so do you expect to find more new species and rare species in your research? Uh, we do, um, and in part because the owner of the uh, Cura Sub Submersible has bought a big research ship, and he can now carry the sub on this ship. He put a crane on it, and uh, the crane can lift the sub uh, off of the ship and place it in the water. So uh, I mentioned how many new species we've, we've been finding in this tiny plot of water right off the aquarium. I think you can imagine if we start moving this sub around to different deep reefs in the Caribbean um, that we're going to find a lot more. A lot of discoveries to be made. There are. How much fun. So I can't imagine that you always have a ship and a submarine <laughs> at your disposal. Do you do any research in shallower water? I do. Uh, in fact, uh, prior to beginning the deep reef work uh, off of Curacao, almost all of my research was based on uh, shallow reefs. So I had the chance to work in the Galapagos Islands, Belize, Central America, uh, Tobago, uh, uh, Trinidad, or Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos, a lot of wonderful places. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm, I'm not just interested in the adults of reef fishes. Uh, at these places. I also specialize in the study of the young or larval stages of fishes. So do you have any examples to show us today? Yeah. Oh, actually, there's one on the screen now. This is a lovely uh, larval sea bass, only about an inch in length, um, that was taken in a plankton net off of Florida. And what species is it? Well, that's an interesting story. You know, I mentioned earlier that uh, um, you can sometimes uh, distinguish species by their color patterns, and that larva has a cool color pattern. It was beautiful. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, for identifying larval fishes, the uh, color pattern doesn't help us, and that's because uh, the color patterns in the larval stages and the adult stages are different. So I think we should challenge our viewers right now and actually ask you what species you think this is. Hey. So we have another poll up for you. And which larval fish do you think matches with the adult fish? Take a moment to think about it and put the answer over to the right. Again, match this larval fish to its adult. So Carol, the results are coming in and people are split between A and D. What do you think the answer is? 
Well, I know what the answer is, and it's <laughs> D. So congratulations to those of you who've got it. But I think you can see why it wasn't obvious to us when we first got that larva um, what uh, adult it would grow, it, uh, grow up to be. And in fact, the story is even more interesting because that uh, adult, that sea bass that was in D that you see on the screen now, that's actually one of our new species from deep reefs off of Curacao. We collected it about 600 feet. So it's just remarkable that we were able to match this uh, larval fish from Florida to a new species of adult um, from deep reefs all the way across the Caribbean Sea um, living off Curacao. So why, um, I mean, why does that larval stage look so much different from the adult stage? Well, uh, for marine fishes, um, regardless of where the adults are living, um, they typically uh, have their larval and uh, egg and larval stages in the surface currents. They broadcast spawn and the eggs go up to the surface and the larvae hatch out and they drift along in the surface currents. So the, the surface currents are a dangerous place for a little tiny fish to live. There are a lot of predators out there. So it's, this, it's a, a completely different environment from where the adults are living and they've evolved adaptations to uh, survive that period that they're in the uh, surface currents. So the, the larval fish that we had up there, um, you may have noticed the elongate fin rays on the dorsal fin. Um, we don't know precisely what those are for, but they certainly make that uh, fish look bigger. And it may be enough to deter certain potential predators. And also some of those fin rays are encased in a, a sheath that have some pigment uh, spots on them. And they kind of look like jellyfish tentacles. And it may be that this larval fish is actually mimicking uh, a jellyfish as a way to uh, avoid predation. Great adaptation. Yes. So I'm a scuba diver myself, and I've seen this fish here on the table, the lionfish, while I've been diving. Is it collected from, um, has it been collected from Curacao? Yes, uh, uh, that's another interesting story. The lionfish are actually uh, from the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and that's where they belong. Um, but in the early 1990s, uh, the lionfish were introduced into the Atlantic off of Florida. Um, they were popular aquarium fishes, so we think they just got released from an aquarium. But they didn't stay in Florida. They uh, moved north up to Rhode Island, south through the Caribbean to South America, and west all the way to Central America. So so why are you studying it if it's not native to the Caribbean and it's not a new species? Well, I'm worried that uh, the lionfish may be impacting the deep reefs. These are voracious predators. They can eat a lot of uh, uh, fish in a short amount of time. And although they're shallow fish in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, off Curacao, we found them all the way down to 500 feet. So I'm worried that these you know, predatory invasive species are sitting down there on these barely explored deep reefs, gobbling up biodiversity before we even know it exists. That would be a big problem. <laughs> so how is your research helping to um, inform this problem? Well, we had a research plan, which was to go and collect uh, lionfish with a sub on deep reefs the same way we do other uh, fish, which is to hit them with the fish anesthetic, and then when they get sleepy, suck them up with the suction tube. But it didn't work. Um, actually, you can see in the video right now, they are just uh, that fish is just swimming away from us. And they wouldn't swim fast, but they would just never stop long enough to, uh, for us to collect them. Actually, that one just ate something, <laughs> even <laughs> while we're chasing them. Um, so uh, one of the sub pilots came up with a plan to to spear lionfish with the sub. And you can see the spear on the right side of that basket on the front of the sub, and the sub's getting very close to a lionfish. And when we get close enough to it, they're gonna pull the trigger on that spear and uh, see if we can get them that way. There, oh, got them. Yeah. Got so not your typical wow. use of a submersible, but it does work to spear lionfish with the sub. Take some ingenuity. So what are you doing once you pull those back up into your lab? Well, we cut open their stomachs and take out the, uh, the gut contents. and. And uh, even if they're partially digested, we can still get a piece of tissue and DNA barcode them. And because we have this database of DNA barcodes of what we've already collected, we can look at the uh, uh, barcodes of the stomach contents and see if they are known species or things that we don't know yet. So you're able to discover their impact, really. Exactly. And we're just starting this work. So stay tuned. We're going to be uh, targeting a lot more lionfish. We've only looked at the gut contents of a few so far. Wonderful. OK. This one comes from Emma. And Emma wants to know, how many fishes have been discovered by your group? Oh, Emma, I think um, of the 30 new species that we've discovered through the DROP project in Curacao, um, about two-thirds of those are fishes. 
Wow. So that's a lot, yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Guy from Alexandria, why did you become a systematic ichthyologist? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, I didn't know that I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was young, but I did grow up um, in coastal South Carolina, so I developed an early love for the ocean. And my dad was a big fisherman, so uh, I have a twin sister, and she and I grew up uh, fishing with dad. So I think the fish in the ocean was sort of in the blood from an early age. <laughs> So this is a great question from Peyton. Peyton wants to know, what are the scientists doing to get rid of the lionfish? Oh, that's an excellent question, Peyton. Um, well, uh, the main thing that uh, people are doing are having these uh, uh, what they call lionfish roundups. So they get uh, as many people together as possible, and they go out spearing lionfish, and they just spear as many as they can. But I think you can imagine that has a pretty you know local uh, impact. Um, and I think uh, in the future, the best way that we're going to be able to get rid of these lionfish is to eat them, um, because I don't think we mentioned earlier that the, oh. There was a great picture of a lionfish sashimi. <laughs> it they looks are, delicious. It is. It's, the, it's a delicious, uh, white, uh, tasty fish, and it's good um, as sashimi, as ceviche, or pretty much any way you want to cook it. So I think um, going forward, trying to uh, get lionfish on the table as a commercially harvested seafood is going to be the best way to control their populations. I'll eat it next time I see it on a menu. Definitely. Jacob wants to know, how do you prevent other fish from getting sleepy from the fish anesthetic? Ah, uh, well, Jacob, you don't. Um, if so, if your fish, if your uh, anesthetic happens to hit uh, other fish and they get sleepy, you just leave them alone because within a couple minutes they'll wake back up and they're fine. Um, the only problem we've had with the fish anesthetic is that sometimes the fish that we're targeting, when they get sleepy, we have other fish come in and try to eat them. And this is particularly problematic with some of the big snappers down there. They will actually follow the sub around. They've learned that when we're down there, that we're uh, often um, making fish accessible for predation. So um, we've taken laser, we've tried all kinds of things. We've been taking laser pointers and shining them out of the sub window to try to distract the, uh, the snappers from Kind of like a kitten. A, exactly, <laughs> right. So this one comes from Ryan. And Ryan wants to know, is pollution affecting reefs that are further down the water? rather than just oh, the shallow reefs? Yeah, Ryan, that's a great question. And uh, the answer is we don't know. Um, in fact, uh, in addition to the biodiversity studies we're doing in Curacao, um, we've also started some long-term monitoring because, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, we know that pollution has impacted shallow reefs. Um, but what's happening on deep reefs? Uh, we don't know. So we've started some long-term monitoring of biological and physical, physical conditions on deep reefs that we hope will go for decades. And we'll be able to answer your question. So we see it, something up on the screen now. Oh, What's yeah. that? That's one of our temperature loggers, or basically a thermometer. Um, we deployed 11 of those uh, off Curacao between 50 and 800 feet. And they're out there right now. Actually, on the screen is year one temperature data. So um, we have these uh, loggers out there taking the temperature um, at these 11 depths every minute. And so every year, we go and pick them up and bring them in. And, and you saw the data on the screen. And those temperature loggers are meant to last for several decades. Decades. So we know that sea surface temperatures are rising, but we don't know what's happening on a vertical reef profile. So our data will tell us that. That's so fascinating. So unfortunately, Carol, we're out of time. And thank you all so much for sending in your great questions. We'll try to answer your questions and post them online in the coming weeks. Can you tell our viewers um, where to learn more about your research? Sure. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, definitely visit the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal, ocean.si.edu. And you can even search for DROP if you want to learn more about our Deep Reef Observation Project. Um, I also highly recommend um, a web uh, blog by one of my colleagues in Curacao, uh, Barry Brown, and that's at coralreefphotos.com. Barry is a professional photographer, and he photographs not just shallow reef and deep reef things, but also things on land. So you can learn a lot about the natural history of Curacao from his blog. And we've seen some beautiful images images from him today. You have, yes. Wonderful. Thanks again. And thank you so much for tuning in today on Smithsonian Science How. If you missed part of this show or want to see it again, it'll be archived later this evening on curious.si.edu. Carol, thanks again for joining us, and we hope to have you here again on Smithsonian Science How. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for joining us, and see you next time.